We want to greet you this evening if you're just joining us by YouTube or Facebook uh, or if you're over in the Fellowship Hall. We welcome you. Uh, this is the midweek service of Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church in Linside, West Virginia. For the past several weeks, we've been studying the book of Ephesians. Uh, we'll continue with that tonight, beginning in chapter 4. We've covered chapters 1, 2, and 3. And uh, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, is stressing that we grow spiritually that we pray for spiritual inner growth more so than any other thing. Uh, we need to grow spiritually. In chapter 4, the book of Ephesians, Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, I had intended really to read the first 16 verses, but we're not going to have time to deal with all those tonight, so I'm going to stop right there, and we'll probably get uh, take care of the first three or four verses. Uh, all of Paul's letters contain a balance between doctrine and duty. Ephesians is a good example of that. The first three chapters deal with doctrine, which is our riches in Christ, our, all the blessings that come from God. While the last three chapters deal with uh, explain duties, which is our responsibilities in Christ. The key word in the first three chapters is wealth. In chapters 4 through 6, Paul, uh, Paul encourages to us to walk in unity. In uh, the first 16 verses of chapter 4, we will see that over the next couple of weeks. And then in the following verses, verse 17 through chapter 5, verse 17, he encourages us to walk in purity and then in harmony and then in victory. And we'll get to that as we go through this book of Ephesians. These four walks parallel the basic doctrines that Paul has taught us in the first three chapters. There are two, two very important words in uh, verse 1. There's the word therefore, and there's the word beseech. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Therefore indicates that Paul is basing his exhortations to duty based on the doctrines that are taught in the first three chapters. The Christian life is not based on ignorance, but it's based on knowledge. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says, And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And the better we understand Bible doctrine, the easier it is to obey Bible duties. The more we understand of God's word, the easier it is to lay our life out there for the cause of Christ. What you believe determines how you behave. Let that sink in. What you believe determines how you behave. Uh, we're moving toward a generation of lawlessness. Lawlessness is all about us. Our belief system is being destroyed. There's the, the things today that are in the news primarily are 
the homosexuality and the transgender foolishness. And I say foolishness. It's foolishness. Uh, and then the abortion issue. These things uh, are before us today, constantly before us. Uh, then, then we come to the word beseech. It indicates that God in love urges us to live for his glory. Uh, God doesn't say, as he, as he said in the Old Testament to the Jews, he doesn't say, if you obey me, I'll bless you. Now, what he says is, I have already blessed you. Now, in response to my love and mercy and grace, obey me. He has given to you and to me eternal salvation by the grace of God. I mean, he didn't have to do that. We were... We were sinners by nature and sinners by choice, yet God loved us so much that he sent his son to the cross to die for us. So how much more blessed can we be? He supplied our needs. There is not, I dare say there's not one person here tonight who has a need that God has not met. Now you may have some wants, but needs that uh, God, God meets. Now, walk does not determine wealth. Just the opposite. Wealth dis determines walk. I'm not talking about temporal wealth. I'm not talking about the wealth that we, we, we think about what's in your, the Capital One uh, advertisement on TV said, what's in your wallet? I'm not talking about what's in your wallet. I'm talking about what's in your account before God. Uh, have you received the salvation? Have re you received his blessing in that fashion? And are you enjoying it today? We see in verses 1, 2, and 3, the grace of unity. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called with all lowliness and meekness and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Unity is not uniformity. Unity comes from within and is a spiritual grace, while uniformity is the result of peer pressure from without. Uniformity, the whole world wants us to become uniform. Uh, the ministerial associations in most cities uh, want us to all get together. The uh, Baptists, the Methodists, Presbyterians, the Catholics, the Jews, everybody, and let's just all embrace and hug each other and get along. That's uniformity, that's not unity. If you have strong convictions about your faith, you cannot embrace the false religions that are a part of the ministerial associations. Uh, and I do not apologize for saying that. I've checked them out. I know what they believe. I know what they stand for. The human body is a picture of Christian unity. Each part of the body is different from the other parts, yet all of them make the body uh, Make up the body and cause it to work correctly. There's the heart and the liver and the, and the uh, legs and the arms and the brains and all the various, various uh, parts of the body. And if one little part of that body is not working right, the whole body's out of sorts. You know that, don't you? You know that. Uh, if we're going to preserve the unity of the spirit, we have to possess the necessary Christian graces, which are, verse 2 says, with all lowliness and meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Lowliness actually is humility. When you know that you have humility, you don't have humility. I 
I tell people that I wrote the book. I said, have you read my latest book on humility and how I obtained it? Well, if, if I did that, then I'm not very humble. Uh, and if you think you're, if you go around claiming to be very humble and meek and lowly, then you probably aren't. You don't have to, t you don't have to broadcast it. You don't have to tell it. People know what you are when they, when they're around you. It means, what it means is humility. What It means putting Christ first, uh, others second, and self last. Now, that is, that is hard to do for most people, isn't it? Putting Christ first. Others second. Self last. Man, I like me better than I like you. I got to cater to me. That's, what, that, that's not humility. That's not lowliness. We are not to, not to think of ourselves more highly or less highly, really, than we ought to. Mm -hmm. We're to see what God says about us. He says we're simply sinners saved by grace. Sinners saved by the marvelous grace of God. So uh, he mentions in verse 2, lowliness, with all lowliness and with meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Don't misunderstand that word. Meekness is power under control. Have you ever heard the, have you ever heard the old adage, walk softly and carry a big stick? That, that's, that's kind of what it what it's like. Uh, meekness is power under control. Uh, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, now the man Moses was very meek, very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. We think of Moses as a very strong man. The Bible says he was the meekest among the meek. And then Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says of Jesus, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. We must seek godly wisdom. Godly wisdom will teach us to put Christ first others second, and ourselves last. And if we aren't doing that, we're not doing what Jesus told us to do. We're not living a dedicated, surrendered Christian life. Then he mentions long-suffering. With longs, Now, what does that mean? It means long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered. Many of us are pretty short-tempered, aren't we? Somebody cuts you off at the, on, the high, on 81, somebody cuts you off, you become a little bit short-tempered. Uh, various things can cause us to be short-tempered, but he says we're to be long-tempered, long-tempered, long-suffering, and then the word forbearance comes up, refraining from the enforcement, from the enforcement of what is due. In other words, if you're due some kind of punishment or retribution, withholding that, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, this can't be experienced apart from love. Kind of like it's a refusal to get even when you feel like you've been wronged. And it's the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25. Uh, then uh, next is the word endeavor in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's being eager to maintain or to guard the unity of the spirit. We must constantly be endeavoring to maintain this unity. You realize that no church 
No church is going to amount to very much if there is not unity. Unity. I'm not talking about uniformity. I'm talking about unity. There must be unity, which is, which is brought on by being close to God, walking with him. Uh, when we think that our situation is great, Satan always wants to move in and tear it up. Uh, the spiritual unity of a home, of a Sunday school class, of a church, is the responsibility of each person involved, and that job never ends. It's ongoing. Satan is always at work trying to wreck what is good. He wants to tear it up. Marriage is something that has to be worked at. You do. You have to put forth, uh, I've had people say to me, marriage is a 50-50 proposition. I disagree. Marriage is a 100, 100% deal. Each, each party should be willing to give 100% to that marriage. And when you do, there won't be any problems that you can't overcome. But you must understand f Satan's function, and that is to destroy physically, spiritually, and mentally every good thing that's going on. Then, love. Forbearing one another in love. Bible says that love suffereth long and is kind. And then it, uh, it mentions peace uh, in Galatians 5 and 17. Uh, it's, peace is hard to come by, isn't it? In Galatians 5, 17, the Bible tells us that the, spirit, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Somebody likened it to having two dogs down in your, down within you, two dogs fighting each other. Question was, which one wins? The one you feed the most. The one that you feed the word of God is the, is the one who wins. And that's true in life as well. Uh, a war is constantly raging within the heart of every believer. Every believer, just because you're a Christian and just because you are uh, coming to church and Sunday school does not mean that there's not warfare in your heart. There is. How do you overcome it? You feed, you feed that, uh, that good dog with the word of God. And uh, if you can't get... Uh, if you can't get along with God and you can't get along with yourself, then you can't get along with anybody. Sometimes I have trouble getting along with myself. I get more disgusted with myself than I do anybody. I sincerely mean that. And I have a talk with me sometimes about it too. Then verses 4, four through, did you say something, Benny? <laughs> I know you do. The ground of unity. Uh, we, we, the first uh, three verses showed us the grace of unity. Now we have the ground of unity, verses 4 through 6. There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Uh, many people try to unite Christians in a way that's not biblical. They say, well, we're just not interested in doctrines, but we're interested in love. Everybody love each other. Why can't we all just get along? Before discussing spiritual unity, Paul waited until he had laid the doctrinal foundation. The doctrinal foundation. That's not opinions. That's the word of God. 
Not all Christians agree on some less important matters of Christian doctrine, but they do agree on the foundational truths of the spirit, of the, fear, of the faith. Unity built on anything other than Bible truth is standing on a very shaky foundation. You know, there are, mi there are minor and there are major doctrinal issues. And I'm about to stop here in just a second. But some Christians, particularly Baptists, Baptists are the worst, spend a lifetime killing gnats and ignoring lions. We, we pick out little things that we think should not be, and we have a falling out over it. We make an issue of it and blow it all out of proportion. While big things, while major things, points of difference, are left un, unchallenged. Failure to respect minor differences precludes us from having an opportunity to minister. Now, I believe, here's what I believe. I believe that if, if a brother, even though he may not agree on some of the things that I hold dear, if he believes in the fundamental foundational doctrines of God's word, like the uh, shed blood, the Bible, the inspired word of God, Christ died on the cross for our sins, things like that, if, if, if you believe that, I'm your brother. And we can have fellowship. And we can disagree on minor issues like on how many times a year to have communion and little things like that. I don't think that's important. But uh, anyway, uh, when, we, when we magnify the differences that we have, it will cost us many times an opportunity to minister to others. Intolerance drives people away. You can express your opinion about things, but do it in love. Do it in love. Let them know that you love them and uh, that you're not going to let these minor differences uh, separate us. I'm going to stop there because, uh, uh, Grant, you can shut me down. <laughs>